Good morning and welcome to this service presented by Burnett Fellowship Church in Maple Ridge. We welcome you and hope that it will be a time to encourage and uplift your spirit and that you will know and appreciate God in a greater way. I just want to say at the outset that one of the joys of knowing God is to be able to give back to God. And if you would like to contribute to Burnett Fellowship Church, if you go to burnettfellowship.com, there are ways there in which you can give your tithes and offerings to the church. I also want to mention that you will be receiving more information about connection chats that we want to have over the next few weeks in our church. We want to have five or six different groups of about 10 people in a group. And you will be able to sign up for the night that works for you or the time that works for you. And, uh, and we want to keep it so that we are socially distanced and careful in this time. And yet we want to begin to uh, talk about the church and its future and what we see together and collectively as we plan and we move forward. And we would encourage you, if you will feel comfortable, to be a part of that when you hear about it and to sign up in advance. As we said, this is our summer for the Psalms, and we're looking through different Psalms each week. And the Psalms are the songbook of Israel, the Psalter. They sang these as they worshiped God together. You know, song is a great part of worship, even for us down to this day. And we want to focus on that today as we go through the Psalms, as we think and reflect upon the Psalms, that they would fill us with praise and that this would be a service where we actually sing a little extra, sing a little bit more, praise God in our time together. One of the ways in which uh, we want to do that is to uh, celebrate what different people in our community are doing as they respond to coronavirus. How has coronavirus made a way for them to respond out of who they are and the gifts that they have. James Zilke is an individual who's written a number of songs, some of them we sing in our church family. And during this time of coronavirus, it has encouraged him to write a song that talks about how our encouragement, our strength, our resource is found in the God of creation, the God of redemption. So his contribution to this coronavirus and where our real hope and rest lies is in this song. So enjoy this as James presents this to us this morning.
Sing it by the way that the sun shines in the deep And the moon shines at night Think it by the way you create new light I want to take a moment to From my son and my daughter Thank you for the way that you showed your love I think about the way that you made the earth When I think about your name And all of us that remain I think about the time you Let's pray together. Almighty God, you are the great God of creation, the one who has put this world in place. And even now as a world, as a uh, united people across this globe, we struggle with this uh, pandemic, this worldwide pandemic. 
we recognize that you are still in control. Nothing happens but that you are not through it all working out your purpose. May we come together this morning to celebrate who you are. You are the great God of creation. You are the great God who sustains the world that you created. You bring your purposes to fulfillness, to completion in everything that you do. And we think about that, God, as we think of you as the God of redemption, the one who sent your son into this world to be born in flesh, to dwell among humanity, to give his life. And he who was equal with God laid aside all the glory he had with the Father to endure death, death on a cross. But he did it to work out your redemption, to be our sacrifice for our sin, that it could be laid upon him, the perfect Lamb of God. And so we celebrate that as we come together. What a great God you are, that not only did you make us, but you redeemed us. And so may we this morning celebrate and rejoice in who you are as we worship together in song and in praise, we pray in Christ's name, amen.
When we come to the book of Psalms, virtually all of the Psalms are addressed to God. They are a, a songbook of worship. Of, they, they praise God or they cry out to God in time of need or they cry out to God in, in needing um, God to intervene in circumstances in their life. Almost all of the songs are directed and focused to God. One of the very rare exceptions to this is the very first Psalm that prefaces this book. And that's because it's kind of an introduction to the book. And so it's gathering the people to pray. It's saying our focus always needs to be on God. And so Psalm 1 is unique because it's not so much a prayer to God, but a plea to the people to pursue God, because in that they will find hope and they will find strength and they will find resource. So this morning, we want to hear Psalm 1. But instead of having it read to us, uh, let's see it as a song of praise and worship. And Jason Silver, a Canadian composer, has put this to music, as have many others, but Jason Silver is going to present his composition of Psalm 1. Listen and reflect and meditate on these words from this great psalm. Happy are those who do not follow the way of the wicked Or take the path that sinners dread Happy are those sit in the seat of the scoffers, but their delight is in the love of the Lord. And on this law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams.
Are you happy? Do, do you live with a deep inner sense of contentment that sustains you and that is abiding? The very first psalm in the book of Psalms is unique. It, it, it's a great introduction to the book of Psalms, but it's different from almost all the other psalms that follow. Because all of the Psalms lead us to God. They're, they're, they're prayers. They're, they're prayers of praise or they're prayers of request, laments, uh, crying out to God for help. Or, or they're what we call uh, Psalms of imprecation uh, in that they are uh, raining down curses on their friends. And, but, but they're Psalms to God because they're not taking their judge, justice upon themselves and their revenge upon themselves, but taking it to God. And all of the Psalms lead us to God. But Psalm 1 is a plea to the people. Psalm 1 begins by saying, are you happy? Well, if you follow the Psalms, you'll be happy because in the Psalms, you take everything to God. And so Psalm 1 is, is a call to say, take everything to God. That's what makes everything right. That's what will give you abiding contentment. Don't make it about you. Make it about God. And so we call Psalm 1 a wisdom psalm because it really is almost proverbial. It's like the book of Proverbs in that it's calling you to seek wisdom, which is found in God. So I ask you again, are you happy? Are you happy? Do you ever stop and wonder whether we in this uh, age in which we live, 2020, uh, that we, are, are we happier than previous generations? If you think past generation, we, we have far more knowledge and we understand a whole lot more things and know a lot more things. We have amazing technology that we are even experiencing in this service because uh, here we are in a worldwide pandemic and we are unable to meet at church, but we are able to meet this way thanks to technology. The, the things, the progress that we have seen in the world, the comforts that we enjoy that have never been known before, for all of that, are we happier? Are we happier? Someone would say the answer to happiness is that it comes as a result of spiritual formation, of seeking God, of bringing everything to God. If that's true, Christians should be happy. But why is it the Christians are often so unhappy, so discontent, so angry, so resentful, so gossipy, so 
upset with the world and their lives and everything around them. Well, when we come to Psalm 1, we find out that happiness is possible. From the very first word of the psalm, it says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. That word blessed means happy is the one who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked. You can be happy. God wants you to be happy, to be content, to be joyful in your life. Tim Keller, in his reflection on this psalm, says, uh, you know, he said, I think people begin by thinking that happiness is normative. That it's normal. We should all experience life and in experience in life uh, find it brings happiness. But the tragedy is, as we get older and go through life, we, we find that life happens, circumstances hit us, and, and happiness isn't always that easy. And life deals out a lot of tragedy. We may experience sickness or live around death, or we may have uh, discomfort and pain, or we may have conflict and rivalries and crises. And sometimes those things happen uh, among the people that we love most and, and the people that we should be engaged with most, and yet we end up with conflict and rivalries in families or in churches, and joy and happiness disappears. Well, the psalmist says, no, nah, it shouldn't happen. Because happiness is not in our circumstances. If you're going to experience happiness, understand that circumstances are not always going to be what you want. So you're not going to find your contentment because of circumstances. But when life hits, we can move from thinking that happiness is natural to begin to believe that happiness is unachievable. My wife and I uh, made the comment one time after uh, seeing a number of TV shows, all of which that ended up at some point in time at the end of their, uh, the end of the day uh, or their work activity or whatever in a bar or a pub or even at home and pouring uh, a glass of uh, alcohol uh, to sort of dull the pain of the day. Do we need something to dull the pain of our day because life is rough? The psalmist says, you know, happiness is possible. If you're people of faith and rooted in the Bible, you should be different from the world around. You should know that happiness is possible. You should be experiencing that as part of your life. Then why aren't we if we aren't? Well, the psalmist says maybe you're seeking it in the wrong way, in the wrong places. And so the psalmist goes on to say, uh, happiness is the result of our deep rootedness, our deep rootedness. Notice in verse three, it says, the happy person, because that's what he's talking about, that person that's happy is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields fruit in its season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. You know what he's saying? He, he says, uh, one of the things he's saying is, uh, the tree is subject to seasons. It, it goes through different seasons. There are times when it blossoms and is beautiful. And there are times when it bears fruit. There's other times when it's more barren and not producing blossoms or fruit. There are times when the, the tree stands tall and strong and is almost imperceptible in its movement as the gentle wind caresses its leaves. And other times when that same tree is bowed and blown by the drivenness of the wind and the slashing of the hail and rain upon it. And even that is useful in building its strength. It's a season it needs to go through. Happiness is not the result of what happens to you. It's not the result of our circumstances. It's rather a result of who you are. Are you rooted? And as the psalmist comes to us in this psalm, 
He says, you know, what makes a Christian is not that you're extra nice or that you're religious or that you do a lot of good things, that you're a great servant. No, what makes one a Christian is that they are a seeker after God. That's how we came to faith, was when we believed that Jesus died for us and we sought God and his way. But it continues when we remain people seeking God in our lives, when we become rooted in him, when we draw our, our strength and our resource not from within ourselves, but from someone outside ourselves, from the one who is God. Because we all go through lean times. We all have periods of time when there is no fruit, but it is the roots that keep us grounded. And in fact, the beauty of this psalm says that, uh, that even when it's time of barrenness of fruit, the leaves do not wither. It, like if, if the roots are deep, there's still life in the tree. The leaves stay. And the reality of our life is the deeper our times of despair, the deeper our roots need to be grounded in him for happiness and contentment and joy to sustain us in the tough times of life. But it can. I was a college student when I was introduced to The Lord of the Rings and I read the trilogy and then I began to read it actually every year in the summer. And I loved it and I loved the movies when they came out. And it's a great story. But in the third book of the trilogy, The Return of the King, some of the members of the fellowship who have been separated uh, reunite and Pippin is reunited with Gandalf. And it's described this way. Pippin glanced in some wonder at the face now close beside his own Gandalf's. For the sound of that laugh had been gay and merry, yet in the wizard's face he saw at first only lines of care and sorrow. Though he looked more intently, he perceived that under all there was a great joy, a fountain of mirth enough to set a kingdom laughing were it to gush forth. You see, that's what the psalmist is getting at, is that even though the face shows first of all lines of care and sorrow because of the circumstance of our life, underneath, as you look through and past that, you perceive that under there, there is great joy and a fountain of mirth. Have you experienced that in your life? Happiness comes when we're deeply rooted. And then the psalmist says, happiness is, is something that's discovered. It's not something you pursue, it's, it's something you discover. The, the reality is happiness is a byproduct to life. Again, it says, blessed is the one in verse two, whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. In the Bible, a blessed life is not the result of, it is always the result of pursuing God. It's always the result of pursuing God. Every time you have this word blessed in scripture, and it appears frequently through scripture, it's a result of pursuing God. You think of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and so on. Happy is the one who pursues God, whose pursuit is the kingdom of heaven, God's things. And what the psalmist is saying here is that you don't pursue happiness it's a byproduct of pursuing righteousness, of pursuing God. If you pursue righteousness, 
you'll get happiness. But the reality is if you pursue happiness over righteousness, you won't have either. And so the happy person is the person who really answers the question, what am I here for? And understands that the, the purpose of our life is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever and to pursue him and, and to know him and to then make him known in our lives. That's the pursuit by which we find happiness as a byproduct of seeking God. You know, there are a couple of ways in which we can come to God. There's a person who comes to God and says, Oh God, I owe everything to you and you owe me nothing. And I just embrace you because I need you so desperately. But there's another person who comes to God and says, uh, You know, I, I will come to you. But in my coming to you, you owe me because I've given myself to you. So you owe me. And I want to collect on that. I heard the story of a, a woman who was concerned about her neighbor and her neighbor was going through some incredibly difficult times and her, her, uh, she had a teenage child who was giving her problems and her husband was uh, filing for divorce and there were financial struggles and stresses in the home. And her life was coming apart. And her neighbor wanted to reach out to her. And so her neighbor uh, went to her and said, you know, what you need in your life is you need Jesus. And if you put your trust in Jesus, he'll put your life back together. He'll, he'll give you all the desires of your heart. He'll make your life full and rich. Well, what's not to go for? So she signs on, says a little prayer. And you know what happened? Her life didn't change its trajectory. Her husband divorces her. The teenager gets in deeper trouble. Her finances continue to spiral around. And, and things go from bad to worse. And she wakes up one day and she says, What good is God? Why did I sign on? What have I got here? Why? Because she said, Well, I'll come to you and then you'll owe me. No. The result or... or it, Happiness is the result of pursuing God just for the sheer joy and pleasure of knowing him and who he is. And in the process of seeking him first, happiness is discovered along the way. And then the psalmist would tell us that happiness here is a choice. Happiness is a choice. When I was in seminary, I had uh, two psychiatrists who taught a class, team taught a class. And they had written a book together. Their first book was called Happiness is a Choice. And what they were saying is, we get to make choices that can move us towards happiness in our life. Now, they weren't saying that that trek towards happiness and the choices that we make were easy. And they weren't saying that uh, it wasn't, in fact, more difficult for some to make those choices by virtue of who they were and what they were struggling with and their, their temperament and their physiology and so on um, than it was for others. But they were saying our choices make a difference. Our choices make a difference. And happiness is not the result of something that happens to you but it's who you are. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. I've mentioned this already, but Hebrew poetry is built upon parallel, parallel lines usually, where the lines are set in contrast with each other, or in this case, where they're uh, the same as one another. And so this psalm says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, stand in the way of sinners, sit in the seat of mockers. And those three lines are really, while they're building on each other, they're really saying the same thing. They are saying, that our friends 
influence our lives. Our friends make a difference. So, and the things that we pursue. And, and if, if we uh, stand with sinners or sit with mockers or walk with wicked, we'll, we'll pay for that. It, it will draw our happiness away from us. So we have to make the right choices. And this isn't talking just about people. This is talking about our allegiances, the things that we commit to, the things that we build our life around. What are you building your life around? Happiness is the result of the choices we make. And if you find yourself sitting in despair, then frankly, you need to choose a new seat, a new place to sit. I said at the outset that Psalm 1 is unique in that it is directed to you and to me rather than to God, but directing us to God, which is the rest of the psalm, to search our hearts and to know and to discern whether or not we're serious about pursuing God, which leads to wisdom, which leads to happiness, which leads to righteousness. And so it's an, it's an appropriate introduction because that's what the Psalms do. They take us to God. They say he's the focus of life and he's the source of happiness. When you're down and discouraged because the circumstances of life are tough, then read some lament Psalms and realize you can take that to God. When people are turning on you and you're finding life difficult, then Read some of the imprecatory psalms, those psalms that are saying, God, I need you to deal with these people because I don't want to become embroiled in bitterness. But I need you to step in and deal with these situations. Or, or when our life is good and we praise God and realize that he is the source of all we have, the psalms bring us contentment and joy and happiness because they lead us to the source, to God in our life. I spoke this week to someone and we were just talking about how uh, in, in the goodness of serving God that, that there are a lot of Christians in life who, who love God, who, who, wanna, who want to make a difference for God and so their heart for God is a mile wide, but the relationship with God is just an inch deep. And the problem with that is the heart is there, but the depth of relationship will not sustain us through tough times. If you want contentment, don't seek it as an end in itself. Realize that it comes when we, when we put our roots deeper into God because we'll never know happiness so long as the hunger of knowing God is unfulfilled and unsustained in our life. Someone says, happy is the one who takes root in God and in his word because they will find that that sustains through whatever circumstance life brings. Father, thank you that you love us, that you have embraced us in your Son. May we know you. May we seek you. May we find you and put our roots deep into who you are so that it sustains us in our life, we pray. Amen. From the heights, I will bring a sacrifice. With these hands lifted high, hear my song and hear my cry. I will bring a 
sacrifice. I will bring a sacrifice. I lay me down on my own. I belong to you alone. Lay me down, lay me down. Oh, and all my heart is much is true. Sure.